Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an emergency resident working in Stockholm um, from Denmark. And today I wanted to talk with you about a very important topic that um, not often is discussed in emergency medicine or, or outside of, of cancer screening, um, which is overdiagnosis. But this is a thing that I believe, and I know a lot of the um, foam blockers uh, like Justin Morgenstern and EM cases believe uh, is absolutely is essential um, for us to uh, be able to work in the modern day society and modern day um, westernized uh, healthcare with increasing, uh, increasingly sensitive tests um, and a lot, of, a lot of drivers that pushes us to do stuff faster, meaning that we cannot use time as a test. And therefore pushing us to do these very sensitive tests earlier on um, with a high risk of harming our patients more than helping them. So what this is all about? Well, I will go into um, the details of our diagnosis and try to put a emergency um, medicine perspective on it. Um, most of the data that I know of is uh, not from emergency medicine, um, but I think it's an area that is understudied and we need to um, be aware of it, of this exact thing in every patient encounter because we are in increased risk of harming our patients um, more and more um, when these drivers that I was just talking about keeps um, being piled up and are not going away. All right, so let's dive into this very, um, I believe, very interesting topic. Um, and the first thing I want to go through is the references. So let's go through those first. Okay, so this first uh, reference slide is um, some of my favorite references in this topic. Uh, they are general and they're really good if you want to go into this um, topic and kind of um, um, have have a um, a casual read of what the um, what uh, what what like the core c principles are and what the um, what the um, the problems with this concept um, will be for our practice. Um, the recommended dose is a podcast by Cochrane, who uh, which has a lot of um, like I think it's twenty or thirty episodes that goes through um, with uh, they, they evolve or they they turn or like they their their core uh, sub subject matter is um, like evidence based medicine, but uh, with a lot of the podcasts going into overdiagnosis. It's also Ray Moynihan, who's the uh, who's the um, uh, the host of the the show. Um, the next uh, and and Ray Moynihan is one of these guys who's also done a lot of of, of studies and done books on on this area. Uh, his book is quoted in the bottom of this of the slide. Um, then we have um, Oxford. Um, YouTube the the CEBM uh, Oxford uh, YouTube channel um, the um, conference called uh, Preventing Overdiagnosis has been going on for a couple of years has been in Denmark at one point uh, my home country and has also I think um, last time it was in Calgary uh, where emergency medicine were front runners in, uh, in it and um, there's an EM cases reference uh, down here. Um, uh, on um, where Eddie Lang, uh, one of the professors in emergency medicine in Canada, um, goes through um, what the essence is uh, for emergency physicians. So I encourage you to check that out. The the next uh, references here is uh, Bo Lusten, a Danish professor and uh, primary care physician who um, has um, made it part of his career to to delve into this uh, subject matter and um, he's done one of the um, most cited papers uh, called uh, overdiagnosis what it is and what it isn't he also has a youtube um, video if you if you google uh, uh, john paulson um, then you will this video will pop up it's like six minutes where he goes through the basics of uh, overdiagnosis and the uh, implementations uh, or the uh, sorry the downstream effects of it Gilbert Welsh is, I guess, the grand old man of overdiagnosis, even though he may not have been the first one to come up with the term. He's definitely uh, one of the, the central figures, and he's the one who's written the book uh, to the right here, 
uh, called Overdiagnosed uh, with Gilbert Walsh and colleagues, um, Dr. Uh, Schwartz and uh, Volotion. All of these three names are central within the overdiagnosis uh, community. Um, moving down the list, there is the, um, or sorry, I should say, uh, Gilbert Walsh has uh, YouTube lectures, but he also has his own YouTube page where he has a video series called LMMH, uh, Less Medicine, More uh, Health. Um, and that's um, the name of one of his other books. But he goes through in short videos, like one of some of the core concepts uh, there as well. So it's, it's a good homepage to check out as well. He has a great um, interview with Vinay Prasad um, as well, uh, also a um, front runner within this kind of skeptical thinking. Um, so you can check Vinay Prasad's homepage out as well and the interview with uh, Gilbert Walsh. Moving down the list, uh, we talked about the EM cases uh, reference, and we have Jerome Hoffman, um, professor in emergency medicine. Um, at I think at UCLA, and he has done this YouTube video on um, overdiagnosis, the concepts, uh, and framed it within an emergency medicine um, mindset as well. So that's good for emergency physicians to check that out. It goes through all the essential bits as well. And then there's some books besides this book to the right called Overdiagnosed, which I encourage everyone to read um, to begin with. Um, or just check the podcast if you don't have time to read. But if um, if, you, if you're interested in other books that are um, in the same ballpark of, um, of um, uh, subject matter, then Alan Francis, um, he's also on the Car Korean podcast. He's a, um, he's a, a psychiatrist and a very uh, um, famous psychiatrist in, from the United States, especially because he was part of the team who made the DSM-4. And he's kind of revolted against the idea of um, the operationalization uh, or dim, like the uh, putting normalized um, hell, uh, normalized life into uh, into boxes and patholo pathologizing them um, yeah so um, he has this book called saving normal and he has several podcasts and, and youtube lectures on the same idea um, this overdiagnosis bit um, or its subject is very um, close, closely related to uh, the concept of medicalization, um, and as we'll go through uh, later on. Also, Ray Moynihan has uh, one of the um, main books on this area called Selling Sickness, and then Jeremy Green has uh, the one the book called Prescribing by Numbers. Um, I've not read um, these books. Uh, I've listened to a lot of podcasts and. Uh, on on uh, on Alan Francis and Moynihan, but I I haven't uh, read these books, so these are usually books that comes up in the lectures uh, on this uh, subject matter, and and I cannot recommend them yet, but um, they are definitely in this um, like area of uh, study. All right, these um, these next slides um, of references, I've um, I've sorted them into. Um, areas that we will go through in the uh, in the lecture. So the first refer reference slide was like kind of definitions and general approach to this subject. Um, then uh, this um, this next box here uh, is why it's important. And why is this important? Um, I mean, uh, the individual level um, arguments about this. I think no one does it better than Iona Heath uh, on this. Um, so that, that's um, recommendable. Um, and then I have some others um, about how to, um, what the problem is if we, um, like with a low pretest probability, goes through um, with a, a high sensitive test and the risk in emergency medicine for that. Um, then we come to the drivers, and there's two great articles here that go through like the overview of the drivers. It's Eddie Lang's uh, paper, um, which he details in the EM Cases podcast, as we said. And then there's this uh, offer um, reference as well. Uh, they have these um, um, these um, figures that will go through with the drivers that drives over diagnosis. Then there's just um, a couple of more than I, that I wanted to recommend, and that's um, the, um, the um, Jerome Hoffman podcast on the BMG, BMJ um, about the fear um, component of overdiagnosis um, and what's driving that. 
um, he has a lecture called variability in, in medicine um, which uh, I'll link in a one of the slides and which is also on the same subject which is which is also good and then just nice to know articles Thomas Hoffman article is really good um, I'll, I'll show some slides with that as well uh, but we'll get to that and then two new um, that's two good new re reviews on the, on the subject matter is uh, Trello uh, here and and uh, this one down here from the I think it's the European Internal Medicine um, Association and then on onto the solutions uh, and the references for that and the, like, there's lots of solutions and I'll be focusing on the individual uh, patient solutions um, uh, more more than the systematic or system um, level um, solutions so I'll try to focus on what we can do on our next shift um, yeah but um, I can definitely recommend a lot of these um, these um, um, uh, these references especially maybe the Kaisers the group and Kaisers don't just stand there do something oh, sorry don't just do something stand there is called <laughs> um, yeah all right, but let's move on to what we're going to go through in the lecture. So, oh yeah, sorry. And, and if you just wanted to get an overview, then, then check these slides, these um, references out first. They are um, kind of the bread and butter um, ones. Okay. So this is the disposition of the lecture. So we'll begin going through what it, what overdiagnosis is and what it isn't. Um, and, then, and then we'll move on to why it's important to know about this, especially for emergency physicians, but in general as doctors, um, and maybe as patients as well. Um, and then we go on to drivers. What drives are like this, uh, this, like, this, this wave of overdiagnosis, and why is it that it's so complex and hard to stop? Um, and spoiler alert, it's, there's a lot of factors going into this. So um, it's not a simple problem. It's the, like a, a complex problem and maybe the, maybe even a wicked problem. And then we have like some solutions on, um, especially on the uh, clinician's level or patient level, not the system level. Even though there are lots of system level um, solutions um, offered in a lot of these references, I will not go too much through those. Yeah, so we'll start off with what it is and what it isn't. So what is overdiagnosis? Well, all right, so what it is in a nutshell um, is overdiagnosis um, sounds like a lot of things that you think that it may be, but it isn't. And we'll go through it uh, right away. But it's important to know that like overdiagnosis is a true disease. Like if you take any disease, um, like cancer, like prostate cancer, or thyroid cancer, or other diseases like pulmonary embolism, or maybe even sepsis. Like if you, if you, if there was a golden standard test where you could look under the microscope uh, and check whether this was cancer, then this would be cancer, as we define it by a microscopic test. Like th this is the true disease. It's as true a disease as the. Uh, disease in the like uh, in the um, in the um, like the disease that people die from uh, is is as true disease as as those, but it's just in a different part of the spectrum. It's in the mi very mild part of the spectrum, whereas the, the the stuff that people die from is in the severe part of the spectrum. Okay, uh, so that's important to state in the, to begin with. This is true disease. It's it is the right diagnosis, so to speak. It's just a diagnosis that people would, didn't need to get um, because they the the, the, the disease uh, would not have this, it bothered them in their lifetime, or it would be self-limiting. So and that is like what goes into a lot of these um, definitions. Um, we can start off with the Eddie Lang, um, the emergency emergency physician uh, professor from Canada. In his article, he, he says uh, overdiagnosis occurs when a person's symptoms uh, or life experience experiences are given a diagnostic label. So this normalization of of potential normal life that ultimately causes them to do more harm than good. So when we give a patient a diagnostic label, 
um, and um, <laughs> we, we, we should be fairly confident that uh, carrying that diagnostic label um, carries with it uh, benefit, more benefit than harm to the patient. Um, um, and that there's a meaning behind the label, um, that there's a um, maybe an understanding of their uh, symptoms and diseases and from which they can be treated effectively. Because if not, then it's just a batch that tells them that they're a patient, and that's a problem. Because, uh, because being a patient means that like you are different from everyone else um, that are not patients. Um, and there's a lot of like in our western westernized society there's a lot of um things that goes with the concept of being a patient in both in forms of the risk factors that um the over or the over diagnosis uh, label will carry with it oftentimes there will be diagnostics performed after it um that may um, yeah <laughs> give you uh, in 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 a lot of scoring systems a higher risk later on um but also there might be a lot of tests done that might hurt you uh, m m some of them may be inver invasive and so on so there's lots of problems as we'll go into about diagnostic labeling uh, without uh, a, a definite uh, reason so um Wollaston, in his article, what it is and what it isn't, overdiagnosis, he, he says bro broadly, overdiagnosis means making people uh, people patients unnecessarily by identifying problems that were going to not cause harm or by medicalizing ordinary life experiences through expanding the disease, uh, disease definitions. And uh, Gil Welsh uh, says that it's the detection of an abnormality that would um, have otherwise never become evident during the individual's lifetime. And recently it became a mesh term as well. And it says the same thing. The only extra thing here, as Bolas in his um, definition also actually says, but I just didn't um, take it with this, uh, or I didn't add it here, is that it, it um, from a science perspective, it also is also, um, there's always a, there's a um, component of, uh, over um, detection and over definition um, as well and we'll talk about those things when we come to the drivers of overdiagnosis Justin Morganson points out a thing about these definitions and a lot of them says that it does um, it does like net harm and the problem with that is that most things in medicine carries a numbers needed to harm and numbers needed to treat and um, we'll go through it in the, ne in the next couple of slides, but there may be, um, it may, it's, it's, it's important that it's net harm. It, uh, it's not only harm, it could be some good as well. And for some patients, the harm that over some, some of the quote unquote overdiagnoses um, carry, it's minor and the benefit, even though we might think it's minor it, it may be ma major for that patient so so it's it's very it may even be individualizable the concept of overdiagnosis but we'll go through i'll, I'll try to explain this in the in the next couple of slides for me as a med emergency med emergency physician um, I like to think probabilistically as well, and I might think of it like a spectrum, as we'll see later on here, um, that in the milder end of the spectrum, like uh, the, diagnosing this patient with this illness uh, or disease, even though it's true disease, maybe a very, very small um, PE, um, then that would, like there would be a one, maybe, for instance, one in a thousand um chance that this patient may benefit for this uh, from this right so we can kind of th think of this spectrum of disease where a patient has um if in severe disease there's a high certainty that diagnosing the patient with the disease will carry benefit for them but in overdiagnosis uh, in very very mild disease um it's uh, very unlikely to carry any high um, uh, high benefit for them, so that's kind of what you, how you also can could could uh, could view it. Let's try to look at it in a more graphical way. All right, so let's try to look at it in a more graphical way here. So we have a 
um, any disease uh, will have like a spectrum of severity or spectrum of illness. We, uh, Gilbert Wells calls it. This is from Gilbert Wells' book, Overdiagnosed, where you have severe disease out here and you have mild disease here. And then you have um, the red line is harm by, a, um, by any kind of in intervention. Um, and we could, uh, sorry, and the green line is benefit from any kind of intervention. Um, so it's important to notice that the harm is totally stable here. And if you want to hear Gilbert Wells talk about this, it's in his YouTube channel, LMMH part two. But you can see that the red line is stable. It doesn't. It, it can be argued that it it maybe maybe um, that some severe disease severe disease will be more prone to harms. For instance, if you do thrombolytics in PE, a big PE or a big stroke um, uh, will carry a higher risk uh, of harm in with thrombolytics than than it would. Um, a mild disease or almost indetectable disease, right? But uh, we we so but we could probably argue at least Gilbert Welch does that harms are kind of stable or at least uh, quite stable along the seriousness of the uh, of the spectrum. Uh, the, um, the the side effects of our medications doesn't don't care really whether you have severe disease or high hypertension or like low hypertension or mild hypertension, right? Whereas the benefits, as this disease becomes increasingly severe, that we 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 believe that the benefits usually are bigger. And the model example here is hypertension, where Gilbert Welch has done a lot of studies on that, uh, where the higher amount of hypertension you have, the the higher benefit you will get um, from treating it. All right. Um, when we <laughs> Once we move into uh, like what we call over detection and over definition, like over det detection, as we'll talk about in detail later, is because of our more and more sensitive tests, meaning that we pick up like a disease that we um, haven't been able to pick up uh, earlier. Um, uh, Jerome Hoffman would say that we go from having um, like normal light microscopes to check for disease will go on to have uh, electron microscopes, right? When we went from having an X-ray to having a CT to having an MR, um, we increase the sensitivity and thereby we find a smaller and smaller amounts of disease that may border on physio phys physiological uh, normal states. Um, the example being, for instance, PE, where you have where a lot of people probably go around with very very minor PEs, um, but if we use these very sensitive tests on them, then we will find these like quote unquote normal PEs, uh, physiological PEs, and these should probably not be treated. So, an overdefinition is what you might call creep, when we dilute the um, the definition of a disease. Um, um, without any evidence of, uh, or without any strong evidence of um, um, the patient uh, benefiting from this dilution of, of the, the definition. One example might be lowering the limit of hypertension definition, like as has as been done the last 20 years, where uh, we've, we earlier had a hypertension limit of 140 and even 100, uh, I don't know, 50 or 60 um, many years ago. Then the, uh, it, it's, it's, it, like it has been lowered, uh, lower and lower, and to a point where uh, we may think we've come into this territory here, which would, would be, with, which would be the definition of overdiagnosis on this left side of the line. Um, and this is like graphically the um, the definition of overdiagnosis. So once you have um, on the left side of this line where these crosses, then you have more harm than benefit. Um, so the net harm here is greater, um, and here the on on this right side of this line, the net benefit is is is, is greater. Um, it's important to know like the. Uh, 
the there's this like concept of parachutes and the first senium has gone through these parachute trials like um we think that a lot of treatments in like it's it's quite healthy to like just know about this graph i think you should, every doctor should kind of be able to like draw this graph because uh, we think that um our treatments are golden right uh, if we don't get that treatment then they'll die and that's usually not the case right it's usually this kind of spectrum of disease this spectrum of benefits to harm ratio that the patient um, will carry and then um yeah uh, so so most most treatments in medicine is not are not parachutes like it's not a one or nothing or all or nothing it's usually uh, much much smaller benefits um, that may be accumulated for the patient um, when having different treatments but there's definitely also a lot of accumulative harms um, when we treat so um, is usually minute differences that we um, help them with through pharmacological treatments but just get one thing clear um our i do believe that uh, like we do a lot of good in the emer in medicine and emergency medicine um so it's not that i believe that we should not treat um STEMIs or or uh like any other severe disease um with emergency care um uh, or treat hypertension and so on and so forth the thing with this is the over detection and over definition with without any information for the patients about like the potential harms of over diagnosis um and um, and also <clears throat> the ineffectiveness of, of this concept um if, if if we keep doing this um so there's a quite there's a clear distinction between this side and this side, right? And then we can argue when we are on the on the left side or the or the right side of this spectrum. We may say like just to hammer home this point as well. Then this could be illustrated in a probabilistic way uh, like this. So up here we may have a number needed to treat of five. We need to treat five patients in order to have one to benefit. That's a great great uh, treatment, right? And then as it goes down, we'll, we have an increasing in numbers needed to treat. We need to treat 20, 100, maybe 200, and 1,000 to be able to actually uh, gain benefit. Um, like, so we need to treat 1,000 with this treatment for, for it to be beneficial for one patient. That's what it means here. And But the numbers needed to harm is stable, right? As we propose um, or assume here. I think it's quite uh, reasonable to assume that, um, 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 and then we can like kind of calculate the ratio here. So, uh, if we have five and 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 a hundred, then uh, we may say for every twenty patients, one is harmed. Like if we only say um, averages here, and that same number if you calculate it all the way down, we have five and one here, right? So. This is kind of where um, this probably should be, like where the the, the graph should be, should be um, crossing here. Um, and then then when you go to the other side here, then uh, for every uh, like this is for every two patients I, I treat, then um, uh, sorry for for every um, one patient I treat, two will be um, uh, kind of harmed. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, down here as well, like for. For every, uh, for every, um, if I treat like t um, uh, ten patients, and then, then, or I need to treat a thousand patients for for just one to be um, helped, and and in that population, um, ten will be harmed. All right. So, um, so we can kind of like, this is a net harm, um, and this that's why the that's the kind of the definition down here. Just to get a few nuances on this graph, because I think it's so so central. So uh, first off, um, Peter Gutsche talked about this the, in a paper called "The Terminology We Use About Medical Drugs uh, Can Be Misleading," and he talks about the concept of harm benefit is only meaningful in, if benefits and harms are measured on the same scale, right? Um, which they rarely are. So given the same data, people might disagree about whether they think the benefits of a treatment outweighs the, outweighs the harms. So it kind of, he, as I understand it, he kind of alludes to the fact that, well, 
every treatment has diff different benefits and every treatment has different harms. Some harms are more acceptable to some patients and some harms are more like some benefits are more acceptable to some patients or more, um, um, much more, um, something they want. All right. Um, so we may, we may, we may think of uh, like there's different benefits uh, with different scales here or different uh, slopes. Um, and uh, in the same uh, way, we may have some, um, we have, may have different harms here as well. So where the harms may be, not be numbered as the harm 100, but maybe 50 or 20, if a specific patient are, is specifically um, afraid of maybe um, a, a side effect of a, of, a, of a medication or if the patient has uh, allergies to that specific medication or something like that, like, oh, giving penicillin is not dangerous. Well, if they are, if they're allergic to it, um, then, then the harms goes uh, way up, right? And the benefits remain just the same. So then the, the, um, the, the potential overdiagnosis line here goes, uh, goes, um, uh, changes. All right. And on the other way around, uh, if you if you have a um, if if there's all, if the potential side effects are not a problem for the patient, then they then they may gain benefits um, at a, a much later point and and over like what we may deem overdiagnostic to uh, one population may be beneficial uh, to that this specific patient. So um, it's it's kind of as I understand it. This is not from the book. Um, this is just me playing or uh, philosophizing over uh, this graph. Um, um, so please comment if, if you think it's wrong. All right. Um, so, so like in the, in the homepage number needed to like the NNT.com, they have different kind of numbers needed to treat, uh, right? Different kind of benefits. This is for aspirin for, um, ACS, I think, oh, sorry, stroke, stroke prevention after a stroke. And, um, so, Death usually is, is a um, is a main thing that people are afraid of. So, 180 about preventing a recurrent stroke is 140, and you may like and the harms for these uh, in this particular study that they took up here uh, were like this, and you may consider that well this is for the standard patient, but if you have someone who has a high bleeding risk, then like then the um, potential overdiagnosis here becomes much better, uh, much bigger. Um, all right, another uh, view here uh, about the graph is uh, from Tammy Hoffman. Uh, she says that in her uh, systematic review here that uh, as that clinician in general, clinicians in general um, overestimate the, um, uh, the benefit and underestimate the harms of a treatment. So that means when we kind of guesstimate this kind of uh, where, where where the patient is on the line, we probably should know about our bias towards um, thinking that the treatment has benefit and the, the, the more benefit than harm. And we should probably move the lines a bit, like move the benefit line a bit down and move the, uh, the harm um, line a bit up. Unless we have like... Wouldn't it be great if the guidelines actually showed us where the numbers needed to treat, numbers needed to harm were, instead of saying do this and do this? Well, that's how guidelines probably should be uh, written, according to, to Justin Morgenstern and Iona Heath and a lot of other people. And that's also the um, viewpoint in this uh, the the Tereo um, article here, article here, where where he, uh, they say. Uh, clinical practice guidelines should support clini uh, clinicians in delivering uh, preventive health service. Um, unfortunately, they often do not provide the information we need to have me uh, with uh, to have meaningful discussions with the patients, right? And this is talking about screening in primary primary care, but the same goes for any other treatment uh, where guidelines just don't give us any uh, numbers needed to treat, numbers needed to harm, or any meaningful. Um, um, like kind of statistics for the patient to to be informed about. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So we were talking about the definition of um, of uh, overdiagnosis and another like definition or uh, graphical hallmark of um, uh, overdiagnosis um, 
um, is when we see um, like the like this is a signature of overdiagnosis, as they say. When we see that the incidence of um, of a disease is rising, but the mortality, the all cause mortality, is stable. Um, so this um, uh, could be because there is more disease coming into the population. Like this is a um, a new like there's been a an, a, a, an explosion in disease, and it could be because of just the nature of that 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 specific disease. Um, but it could also and much more likely be iatrogenic that we diagnose more disease. Okay, but if we had we, if we were diagnosing the disease that was really dangerous. <clears throat> um, and we uh, and and we uh, thought that our treatment was was helping. Then we would think that there is there would be a fall in mortality, right? But what we are seeing is that um, that <laughs> the incidence is, is increasing. So we're diagnosing more, but we have the same amount of mortality, right? So um, what this has this why this is important and why this is like the hallmark of our diagnosis is that well. We we have we di probably di the conclusion from this is we're diagnosing much more mild disease that uh, wouldn't benefit from treatment because it just it goes away anyway. Like the treatment doesn't help, it doesn't uh, hurt, it just goes away anyway. Um, yeah. So it's probably uh, what, what if we could part this uh, like uh, graph into the early stage and the late stage, then this this is especially the early stage disease that. Um, um, that that keeps uh, increasing and the late and the late stage uh, just keeps going um, no difference in that examples uh, from the real world data about this is this is from Moynihan um, this and these are cancers but with, and what you see here is like thyroid cancer <clears throat> uh, melanoma um, kidney cancer um, prostate cancer and breast cancer. Uh, these are all screening cancers. I believe that colon cancer, which has a um, mortality specific um, uh, decrease in can in death from ca uh, colon cancer, like so, so it's 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 um sorry disease specific. So it's colon cancer specific deaths decrease by diagnosing colon can like by screening for colon cancer, but the all cause mortality is the same. Yeah, so um, so and 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 I uh, people usually don't care what they die from, right? Uh, they 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 just want to live and have uh, meaningful and and uh, lives that are are with um, uh, like quality of life. Uh, so um, so we probably should be measuring all cause mortality always. That's at least uh, like a lot of these guys in within this field. That's their argument. Um, another graph that usually shows, like that, of, is often shown is the concept of lead time bias. So the problem with diagnosing someone early on, like so, if we if we on the first one here has um, um, the patient's age, and this is when the patient's uh, patient gets symptomatic, then at uh, maybe at year 65 years of age and then well there's no treatment for this because it was diagnosed this late well then and then they die then they they, they have a five-year survival uh, here yeah if we screen this uh, this same population then they may um, be diagnosed uh, at 60 years but if we don't have an effective treatment to give this patient um, for this disease um, then they will just live longer. They will have a higher survival because this is when like <laughs> the, 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 the stopwatch is started here. So instead of having a survival of five years, then they will have a survival of 10 years, but this is the same disease, right? You're just, you're just cheating by stop, like starting the clock early on, but you don't, you're going to gain any life years. It's like the absolute amount of years they, they will live is the same, but the absolute amount of years they, they live with the disease is longer. And it's arguably um, more um, harmful to live <laughs> knowing that you have a disease than not, as we will talk about later. So that's, this is what we call lead time bias, and that's why we should not, uh, like, we should be really skeptical when articles uh, talk about survival in, in 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 screening, especially. I'm not an epidemiologist. There might be some cases where survival is a good measure, but in screenings and in overdiagnosis, survival is a really um, bad um, outcome to measure. 
<clears throat> as we talked about, um, cancer-specific or disease-specific mortality is another way that sometimes is measured, where they say, oh, well, <clears throat> well, we decrease we we decrease uh, colon cancer or we decrease um, uh, the amount of uh, PEs um, or, or people don't die from PE or or in, I think it was in the CRASH-3 study where they said that this disease-specific mortality decreased by giving tranexamic acid. But the problem is that the all-cause mortality um, didn't. I'm not sure in the, in the CRASH-3 study. I think, I believe, uh, you can check out Justin Morgenstern's post on this. But I believe that um, the, the problem is what you call the, I think it's called off-target um, deaths. So um, uh, it comes back to this concept of, well, what we measure um, is just dying from colon cancer. But if we measure just how long they will live, no matter what, then well, then they may die from something else. They may die from treatment of the colon cancer, like the, the, the problems with the uh, chemotherapy or uh, some other complication, right? So if people don't live longer and we just give them longer lives with the disease instead of um, having this like um, um, graph up here where they only know that they have a disease when they become symptomatic, then then we're not helping people, um, right? That's the that's the essence of this. So probably we should be measuring this in all cause mortality instead of just see specific mortality or survival. Um, yeah. What we really want is the C1, right? We want, um, if we want a screening or any kind of test, um, then we want an effective treatment because if we have an effective treatment, then we can increase the length of their uh, like lifespan in this end. And that is what we want. That's true, like increase in survival, right? Or, or decrease in all cause mortality. All right. <clears throat> Moving through this definition of overdiagnosis, oftentimes is there's talk, we talk about what you call the barnyard pen of cancers. Uh, and this is another concept of how we can think of diseases, right? So we may have, think of diseases as, um, um, as um, turtles, um, rabbits, and birds. Um, and we may think of our diagnostic tools as being this... Um, this pit or this um, fence. So if we have this uh, fence, then um, the birds, the, the fence will not help, like the screening test or the test that we're doing will not help because the birds will fly away. They are not, um, they are not, uh, they, 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 they are too hard to diagnose. Our tests are not catching them because um, uh, the, 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 by the time uh, that ca like that cancer develops so fast, it'll just um, they they will like uh, die within um, shortly. We will not be able to like pick these up um, with screening. That's the, the that's the birds, right? We cannot do anything about the birds. Um, as it uh, um, then you have the the the, um, the turtles. And and, and this, sometimes they call them the snails if they're non-progressive at all. These are the cancers or disease processes that um, either are self-limiting or are contained in the body uh, with no progression, or are um, or we are progressing so slowly that we will not die from them. We will just die with them. And the classical example here is prostate cancer, mild disease prostate cancer. All right. So the birds. We're too late. Uh, it's really aggressive. Um, the the turtles often grow too slow. It doesn't matter, especially in seniors. If you're older, then it doesn't matter. And um, and the snails, what you don't what you <laughs> don't know won't hurt you. What we want to find is the rabbits, right? And what we should aim our diagnostic tests at is picking up the rabbits. That's what Gilbert Welsh talks about, right? But right now, uh, with at, at least screening. We we are almost only finding the turtles, and that's a problem because they would be, they wouldn't be a problem anyway. One of the problems of emer of overdiagnosis is that you don't know whether or not you are the one who has been overdiagnosed. It's like it's something we know from studies afterwards, like in retrospect. Sometimes we may have a hunch, but in general, 
if you think if if you have it, then then that's disease under the microscope, right? And 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 once you once a cat out is, is out of the back, once you have the subsuming segmental PE, then it's really really hard to not treat it. Uh, at least if you haven't had a conversation about the like the potential risk of overdiagnosis before heading into the study. So. All right, so some some of the common examples of overdiagnosis is incidentalomas. This uh, may not always be overdiagnosis. Sometimes incidentalomas are like like lucky catches, but almost always they are quite. Um, so incidentalomas are these like things that we like uh, minor abnormalities that we find on a CT scan off target usually. Like if we're looking for an appendicitis, then we find a um, a cyst that looks a bit wonky on the um, on around the kidney. Um, and what should we do about that? Well, that's an incident loma, right? Um, and and because it, it's not it's not it's not what we look for. It's kind of our test, like uh, through no fault of our own, kind of became a screening test, sadly. And we and we um, that screening um, test kind of showed us that. That there is abnormalities in the body that like doesn't have anything to do with our like the symptoms that the patient presented with, and that's like yeah. Oftentimes this is like it leads to a lot of tests for the patients, and we we probably yeah usually doesn't carry too much of a um, benefit for them um, sometimes, but mostly not, and that's where it's called overdiagnosis, right? Um, in oncology, well, we talked about well screening for breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon, thyroid, melanoma. All of these, no cancer screening, according to Eddie Lang, has ever um, shown a reduction in all cause mortality. And why is that? Well, um, well, there is this theory of the aging soma, uh, as uh, Gilbert Welch talks about, and it may be that. Um, that no matter what we do, it's kind of like the the reason why we can get these cancers uh, to begin with is because our immune response or immune system or some kind of other like the body's function is declining and and even though we may not die from the cancer, we we will die from something else and the the actual like the, the cancer is just a symptom of the aging soma, and that's why we're not seeing a decrease in 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 like in in mortality because we would die anyway from that's that's kind of the, the aging soma theory yeah. um in psychiatry in, in psychiatry like um alan francis talks a lot about the adhd and one of the studies that is often quoted is that when we put um when we put uh, toddlers in a school uh, earlier on, there are some studies that show that um, if you're the youngest in a in a in a, um, in a class, you will more likely be diagnosed with ADHD, and that has nothing to do with the disease in general, just to, something to do with the normal life and how toddlers like when there when there are social expectations on them, kind of breaks out uh, like or cannot manage. And that's if, if if they were put in them in a, in a different class with a um, lower uh, like uh, like with uh, which uh, fit their their development, then it would not be a problem. They would not like have these um, have these uh, uh, symptoms, right? Um, so that, and, and ADHD is, of course is a spectrum. There's definitely some who has it, right? But there's been an avalanche of overdiagnosis in that field. And you can read like the Ellen Francis book, Saving Normal, for for uh, or listen to his podcast for that. Autism spectrum disorders is another one. There's lots of other examples, right? And in general medicine, hypertension is one of them. Um, where um, there was one like I think it's with the 2007 update where they. Kind of overnight, millions of um, Americans became hypertensive overnight because of their new definition, with mi very minor benefits attached to that, if any. Um, and it's like if if you apply those uh, condition or those definitions to the population in Norway, um, almost like 76% of them would have hypertension or hypercholesterolemia, right? So they would like we are all at risk. If the Norwegian population or is one of the most healthy in, in the world. Um, are at risk and we are all at risk in this like 
um, if these definitions increased like that. And maybe, maybe it's like, okay, well, maybe, maybe there's a benefit for all of us to like, if we have anti hypersensitive medication in the water, right? We have, we do have some things in the water. Like we have some, some countries have D vitamin enriched milk. Um, so sometimes there is maybe a net benefit for the, for the population in general, but it remains to be seen that for these specific things that there is. All right, and this like the same thing with pre-diabetes. There's lots of lots of examples about these things. So, examples in, me in emergency medicine. Well, PE is one of the examples. Um, it's kind of like it's kind of on the fence uh, now. There's this block where and and Kirsten Dewitz, <clears throat> who's a PE emergency physician extraordinaire. She talks about um, she, she's done some studies that shows that the subsegmental, like the small PEs, may even, may carry an increased risk for recurrence, and this may um, then be what, like what we probably should ask the PE patients about is their risk factors more than their like their PE, like the, the small um, the small subsegmental PEs may be important if you have a lot of risk factors because then you have a recurrence risk. But if you don't have any risk factors, then it's probably not a recurrence risk. So it's kind of on the fence. We need more studies on that. But uh, other things like CC utilization in abdominal pain, like uh, incident sonomas and so on, we use more and more CTs to, to like diagnose minor things. Um, POCUS is one of these like gray zones. If you kind of know what <clears throat> and use it like a POCUS examination, like yes, no questions, don't look at the... Um, incidents at almost that you may find or the what is that kind of thing <laughs> uh but just f f like laser focus on what what is at hand then it's probably not a problem as much but but if you uh, if you're not thinking probabilistically but you're thinking like oh that, there's a thing and there's a thing and we should know like and you're describing everything that you see um then then definitely there's a high risk of this maybe a, a course of overdiagnosis and misdiagnosis, but that's another thing. Uh, sepsis, there's this article by Mervyn Singer. I, I just want to talk about it because it's so... Um, in, it, I think it's funny that like the, the Mervyn Singer, who's made the Sepsis 3 uh, update, also did like, this article called Sepsis Hysteria, Excess Hype and Unrealistic Expectations. So sepsis is definitely one of these areas where it may be sepsis, it may be bacteremia, but... But under the microscope, but but the patient can probably like be managed as a normal infection. Uh, we kind of like the kind of don't know what sepsis is, and there's a drive towards over definition of it. So yeah, and aneurysms and CC angi angiography from thunderclap headache. Like we know, four percent of the general population has some kind of, some amount of aneurysms. So if you start off when doing a CC angiography of these patients, then there is a high risk of finding these aneurysms in one in maybe 20 or one in 25 that may not be related to their like very likely not be related to their symptoms right um so if you don't find blood but you do find an aneurysm then it's kind of a problem right because now you've given the patient a um, lifelong worry that oftentimes is operated on and carries a high risk right um, I think it was Eddie Lang who also had mentioned a study that they did in Canada where <clears throat> they looked at CG angiography for stroke. And they said that 33% had a downstream <clears throat> um, problem uh, or a downstream, like they, they had a finding that they needed to check up for um, for months or years um, and get several scans and so on and so forth. So cascade of care, right? And low risk chest pain workup as well. As well. Um, John Hoffman often mentions um, herniation on CT scans uh, is also an overdiagnosis topic. If you only know, if you don't look at the patient, but you just look at the CT scan, and also um, 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 cervical artery dissections uh, is probably a very overdiagnosed thing as well. Okay, so that that was a lot about what overdiagnosis is. And I will go on to say what it isn't. And what overdiagnosis is not, it's not misdiagnosis. When we test the patient with a low pretest probability of a disease, if we test that patient anyhow, for, for whatever reason, um, with a very sensitive test, 
um, like a CT scan. So for instance, your I don't think this is anything, but let's just do the scan kind of mentality. Um, then you have a low precess probability of it, of it being serious disease, but you're doing the scan anyway. Um, then there's a risk of misdiagnosis because uh, misdiagnosis like with a false positive. So you may have a false positive or, an, or, or you may have a real disease like the overdiagnosis where you have a real disease, but it's just minor and, and it would never be a problem for the patient because it would be self-limiting uh, or uh, it would be um, something that the patient would never be symptomatic about in their lifetime. Right. Um, so that's the double. That's what I would call a double whammy of testing someone with low pretest probability or w with below the like the test threshold. If you use the Kashira's uh, threshold model, um, and in some sense, we talked about can be uh, and may not. Sometimes it's real, like real disease that is on the severe, more severe part of the spectrum, and then it's just a lucky patient. But you never know which one is which. That's the problem. When you when you when you find it, then like overuse and over testing, like overuse doesn't need to be like it it, it overuse like doing CT scans on everyone or it, it's often time like most of the time it will carry a high risk of overdiagnosis, but it not, it's not necessarily um, becoming overdiagnosis. If it's no normal, then it's normal, right? But they are related, and over treatment. Like you don't have to like overdiagnosis is not overtreatment. You don't have to treat the patient if you have overdiagnosis, and you don't have to um, uh, like so. So it doesn't necessarily one doesn't necessarily follow the other. Um, and an example is like acute otitis media. It may be a perfectly normally diagno diagnosed um, thing, but because of the pressure to prescribe antibiotics, then. Um, then or put in um, put in uh, small um, tubes um, for children, as we I think in Scandinavia or especially in Denmark are the leading <laughs> leading uh, world leaders in per per person or per capita. Then then there's a um, like it's a, it's good like we know we should in most cases don't treat uh, with penicillin, but a lot of places we are treating. Right, so that's that would be over treatment, but without over diagnosis. And having over diagnosis without over treatment, that's the hard part, right? Because that would be having the discussion with the patient where we when we find something like we find the subsegmental PE, but we don't treat it. And I don't, and, and Justin Morgenstern and a lot of other people would say that we should never get to the point, or we should at least inform the patient about the over diagnosis risk before getting to that point. Because once we are at that point, it's really hard to not to treat the patient. <clears throat> All right. So that was the first part. First part, and we'll go into now why is it important? Why is why is overdiagnosis important for emergency physicians to know about? So I'll talk about the individual individual level, uh, the um, the doctor level, and the system level. Okay. So the individual level is. I think it's illustrated really well by um, Yayona Heath uh, and, and in her article where she has Susan Sontag, uh, a poem by Susan Sontag where they say, illness is the night side of life, a more um, onerous uh, citizenship. Everyone who's born holds dual citizenships in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Although we all prefer to use the good passport, Sooner or later, each of us is obliged at um, feast for a spell, uh, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of the other, of the other place. And the problem is, I think it is illustrates quite well that there's a there's a like, like there's two pathways here. As Gilbert Welch also talks about the pathway of health and the pathway pathway of disease, and we want to stay off the sick or the patient pa passport as long as we can <clears throat> because being a patient is not fun it reminds of us of our mortality and sometimes this rem reminding of mortality uh, carries anxiety um, carries a lot of mental issues it, it makes it makes us look at our um, person in a different way there may be some insurance problems as well with this like if we get the diagnosis of TIA 
or anaphylaxis it may be harder to insure us and so on so usually we, we you can like part this into mental problems for the individual um which are usually huge and immense and um, but also physiological um which which may be like the physiological ones may be the um well once we find the incidence aloma then we need to um, either we need to do several scans, right? And we may even have to take a biopsy. That biopsy may bleed, uh, and that may lead to as, like a, having a stoma or something like that because of the complication. Like this is like every doctor knows about these like history, or, like these these stories, and uh, we're not measuring this. We're not talking about with our patients with the, like the risk of overdiagnosis and the cascade of care if we test them. So that is really important, right? And then we also talk about like if we overdiagnose someone, then oftentimes there's only like if it's mixed misdiagnosis, then there's no like then, then it's not real disease, and then, then there's only harm to be had from the for the patient, right? If we treat them with, for instance, anticoagulation, they can only be harmed by that because there's no benefit because there's no, no disease. That would be mis misdiagnosis. In overdiagnosis, there may, as we talked about, may be some benefit, but the benefits are outweighed uh, by harms in a long, uh, like in a, in a big way. Um, okay, so that's for the individual. I'll just take a small tangent because I, there, <laughs> I, I think it's really interesting, this area, and I'll just bring in some other sources that you may find interesting and, and check out. Um, a, a bit of a deep dive in this. So there's this thing called the looping effects when we talk about classification of diagnostics. And this is called Hacking's Looping Effect. And in this book by Susan O'Sullivan, um, she talks about um, this and she says, people in body classifications and classifications are created by doctors. When people have health problems they don't understand, they search uh, their environment for an explanation. And explanations uh, generally make, pe uh, make people feel better. Um, answers might come from television programs, social media, newspapers, from neighbors, books, and so on. Doctors are another source, and many diagnoses are subjective because they are based on a constellation of typical symptoms rather than a single diagnostic test. That means a doctor can choose to diagnose more cases or fewer depending on how lax they are with rules of classifications. So she talks about like. A lot of the, and Jerome Hoffman talks about this uh, as well, there's usually no golden standard for a lot of the tests that we are using or for, for the diagnosis that we're making. And we kind of, we can, like by giving a patient a diagnosis, we are, we are doing what hacking calls making people. Because we're kind of making a person, um, we're, we're, we're kind of making a, um, a new version of a person when we're giving them a diagnosis that they will try to conform to and when they're conforming to this new kind of way of being um, and, and identifying with this then they will also change uh, like and that's that's the other part of the looping effect that they will change the diagnosis as well or what what it is and, and we'll go further to the next slide here by Kurmeyer. And you can read this by yourself as well. But this is a looping process where he talks about like that, like this interaction between like the patients getting a diagnosis that they will identify with, but also um, the, the the patient's um, environment and the, like the group that they're a part of, they will see this diagnosis as well. And then this kind of will create an interaction where kind of they, they will become their diagnosis um if they weren't already and that's really really a problem in mild disease especially if it's just normal life that we're diagnosing as a disease um that's really like 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 yeah medicalization or um like making normal life a pathology and that's really problematic And Susan O'Sullivan goes on about the what you call templating. The brain's prototypes for this are culturally determined, um, and these are each like in, in the UK, recurrent stomach upset might make a person think that they have IBS. But the same symptom in the Mosquito Coast could interpret, inter, uh, be interpreted as an indication of parasitic infection or perhaps the onset of a greasy sickness. These are each conditions in, uh, conditioned. Uh, interpretations of bodily change that can be influenced of illness behavior. Um, 
and so on. You, you can read this um, by yourself. But in general, what she's saying that is, um, like the Western medicine promotes a pathologization of every bodily change. Like we're pathologizing normal life. And we usually make these diagnostic groups for patients where they get a box that they will then become because and, and and that's kind of the expectation of the patient as well because of the culture so they will become this and that is what she's discussing in this book is fascinating i think because what she's saying is that when we become this box and we determined that these boxes are is the best way in, in in medicine to to diagnose people and to then then the problem is that it's often hard or impossible to for people to get out of this box again right um, they keep this diagnosis, they carry it with them and they, it becomes part of their, ident their identity. Um, and when we then see it, uh, if, if they weren't already, then they have become this and they like, they, they take on this persona about this. They, it's templating it's, as it's called. <clears throat> so Susanna Solomon is not the only one who's talked about this. Um, if we go back, then there was a philosopher who talked about this a long time ago. Oh, sorry, before that, um, about the expectations that we have. Uh, I think this is also fascinating that um, Mandrola uh, talks about this uh, called, uh, about this book called The Elephant in the Brain uh, in this article here. And he, he says that the provocation the, provoca the provocative conclusion in, is that healthcare isn't just about health it's also about grand signaling exercise so the problem is that oftentimes in medicine we are um like the the signal here is people people uh, are not um tempt or they, they're not satisfied with just um having someone giving their opinion by examining them anymore they more and more want uh, ct scans or blood samples or something more as a token of, um, of them being taken seriously and i would argue this may be because we're not communicating well and, and not doing compassionate care well or expla explaining it well to them um, so we may be like kind of transferring um communication and uh, like time for talking with patients with scans and blood samples and this is kind of one of the drivers for overdiagnosis um <laughs> i think it's funny that john boylson who is one of these persons in this area has made this uh, study as well about point of care ultrasound in general practice and how it's, it's viewed for the patients like do they feel like they're being examined better or or less better no matter what like and and uh, you can read the abstract yourself i think is a really good um and, and important study this where they conclude that uh, that they found that uh, including the focus um is a positive experience overall for the pa majority of patients I, I would say like yeah until the next test arrives um <laughs> i get i bet the stethoscope had the same effect uh 200 years ago so i and and the problem is that we're we're becoming more and more uh, sensitive so we're in higher higher risk of overdiagnosing if we don't know what we're doing and i'm yeah so um, i would sometimes like do what you may call the comforting point of care ultrasound for patients with a um with patient for patient with chest pain so you will just do the ultrasound scan of the heart and show them the picture like this is a normal heart this is how, can you see how it beats it looks perfectly normal like so so that they like you kind of use this kind of effect um to get the best benefit for them um all right, but but yeah. So this is this is a tool that I sometimes use actually. Uh, but um, be aware that you you have to like like have your you're not doing it to find anything. And if you find anything that is just minor, or so you you will not usually tell them about it because that would be overdiagnosing or high risk of overdiagnosing them, right? Um, so you should think of it as a test that is not done, but is more like it. kind of it's not really placebo, but it's um something similar um kind of the elephant in the brain a thorough examination 
kind of like that an extension of the of the term of a thorough examination and what the patient culturally believes is a thorough examination towards their path of healing um, if you want to know more about this area, um, um, a, a somewhat controversial figure um, um, and Dr. Wayne Jonas has written a book about this placebo effect and the meaning response that is um, worth um, taking a look at if you're and, and, and kind of taking your own um, takeaways from from what he's saying and having a skeptical um, eye on that. All right, and then Ivan Illich, um, who was a, a um, Catholic, uh, Catholic preach, uh, preacher or, or, or a priest, but also a philosopher and, and a, criti a guy very critical about the general societies more and more, um, uh, like that society is becoming more and more comfortable and we're losing our skills as humans because we are now dependent on the institutions uh, to, to, to do a lot of the things that we used to be able to do ourselves. Um, and he's exemplifying this in the book called The um, Medical Nemesis, um, which is, uh, I would encourage you, encourage you to read this um, summary um, of, of that book because, um, yeah, um, by, by Mahoney, uh, a doctor, looking at whether it's real, still relevant, and it is. So he talks about, even Illich talks about the Sisyphus syndrome, that the more healthcare we're given to a population, the greater the, dem the demand uh, for it, right? Um, and kind of, we, we're kind of being, his, uh, as I understand it, his argument is that we're kind of get it being castrated by the inst these institutions in the westernized medicine um, because um, people cannot... Well, we do, they don't know anymore um, what to do when they have a fever at home, maybe, or they don't know um, like what to do when they have pain. Um, they cannot self-manage stuff anymore because we are making people more and more reliant on us as an institution. And then we complain when they come in with a fever, but in, in, in actual facts, we should probably think about the systems that are, has driven them and the lack of education or and the lack of experience throughout generations, um, that the, the, the degradation of self-management um, in, in, in disease and sickness and death and birth and so on. Um, and this is a, like, I think it's a fascinating conversation to have and, and some great points uh, by even English. All right. So this tangent of mine, uh, like the, I guess the, the kind of the conclusion um, could be here that the Western medicine is, is what medicine, Western medicine people expect. Like we're, um, we are like this because we have grown culturally to expect that this is quality of care. We wouldn't be like most of us would not be satisfied if, if we went to a witch doctor and people from a culture where witch doctors are, is a good thing <clears throat> would not be um, satisfied with our kind of treatment. And giving them no less than, uh, yeah, giving them, giving, giving our patient no less than that is considered like. Good care is doing the focus, doing the blood samples, and anything less than that is kind of viewed on viewed as as inferior. Um, and I would again argue, I think communication is what we actually need here to bridge this gap and to gain back the trust of our patients. But that's another um, lecture I've done. And so this is often, um, but the problem is this now involves more and more sensitive tests, uh, giving them. Um, and giving the patients effectively diagnostic labels like uh, in Denmark we have what you call diagnostic guarantee um, so that they have a diagnosis uh, and people usually feel comfortable with having a diagnosis uh, as I believe is the um, is what is said about the diagnostic guarantee or the argument for having the diagnostic guarantee because then there's an explanation but as we'll come to like time as a test is so important we need we need to have like if you're getting a diagnosis too too fast, then it's probably a, if you're not having having severe disease that needs urgent treatment, then it's probably a bad thing for you to have a diagnostic label early on. Um, yeah, and the sense more and more sensitive tests are just doing what the people are getting at, uh, especially once they want the diagnosis now and not tomorrow, uh, and don't want to wait. Um, so. 
and diagnostic labels change people as we talked about uh, and it's part of the narrative or an identity of that patient um, and it, it, like there, through these more complex uh, theories of looping effects and templating they kind of becomes um, the person's own identity um, and will make often the, uh, and western westernized medicine these these categories that we put patients into they usually create these chronic problems um, because pe people cannot get out of their boxes uh, once they're in them and there's no resolution in our culture but in a, in a lot of other cultures as both Susanna Solomon and Wayne Jonas talks about um, there are resolutions like as a society they can get out of their diseases or illnesses whether they're somatic or psychosocial or mix uh, they can get there's like a way out um as they as susan o'sullivan uh, describes in her books um as well as well <coughs> but we don't really have that and then we become helpless and in need of the institutions right so this is the kind of a vicious cycle where we expect this and then we kind of get dependent and when we get a chronic disease and we should the, 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 that's just a long way of saying we should we should do all we can to not give patients diagnostic labels if they don't need it so I, I, I guess the diagnostic guarantee that we have in Denmark is it's kind of I think it's detrimental to health um, in a lot of ways and it should be replaced by a push to communicate with our patients ask to talk about uh, risks and harm uh, risk benefits and kind of like all the all everything i've talked about in compassion to care uh, or compassion to care lectures i think that is what we should do instead of just labeling our patients and 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 yeah lots of pa people have, have said this much more smartly than i have but uh, i'm just this is the gist of of the argument all right so we were talking about why this is important that was a long way around to saying that what what is important for the individual why what why it's important for the individual not to be overdiagnosed. let's talk about just shortly about the system why it's at the system level a problem so there's lots of downstream effects and i think graphically it's quite easily like quite quite well shown here if you have a normal distribution of any kind of disease maybe hypertension <coughs> And then if the old criterion is here then the new criterion is here and then we have over definition which was part of the over diagnosis right um so we define we put a new definition hypertension is now 130 or 120 or pe's are now sub sub segmental well then we um from having maybe only maybe i don't know 10 15 percent of the population having this disease now it's much closer to 50 percent like this increase like just a small moving small amount moving to the left in this graph like this is not it's not proportional to just uh, if you move from here to here then that would be not no problem moving from here to the majority of the population that's a huge problem right so that's a big amount of the population that would be great if we knew that there was a benefit but oftentimes there is no benefit they don't take into account this when you do the guidelines on this and you can check out john ioannidis jerome hoffman um, and for justin morgenstern's um, like articles lectures and blogs on on guidelines and why they should be changed the way we do it all right um then we have so <clears throat> so they create and so that's would be over definition you also have like the just pure over diagnosis uh, when we like like if a fir like as, as we said before if one in a one in three patients with stroke has a like a a, 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 a finding that is a true finding but <clears throat> needs follow-up then that's we're creating a huge tsunami of patients follow-ups that and and that may carry very very little benefit if any for the patient <clears throat> so what we're effectively doing is that we're overcrowding our system with low effective care uh, and low uh, need care right so, uh, <laughs> and uh, creating this access block that we're seeing all over and it's not the only it's not at all the only reason for access block but this is very very is a very important factor this i believe for the access block that we're seeing on the crowding that we're seeing all over the system but also manifesting in the emergency department we're getting at what 
Iona Heath calls the twin problem of overdiagnosis, or what you might call reverse Robin Hood effect. We're getting, we're giving, um, um, uh, like this disease mongering has meant a shift in the attention from the sick to the well and from the poor to the rich. All right, so we're we're kind of um, the twin problem is uh, the twin problem is that every or with every or diagnosis there is an under diagnosis in the another part of the system, meaning that um, meaning that um, the money that goes to the over diagnosis in one part of the system or the focus or the um, um, yeah, the, <laughs> the opportunity cost of focusing on one part makes us not focus on another, uh, like on the part that, and usually the part that we're not focusing on, focusing on is usually what really needs, uh, we, we needs that money. Um, and I, I know system, like uh, our system is complex. It's a complex adaptive system. And so I'm, I'm no expert at all, at, on this at all, but it's definitely, uh, definitely one of the um, factors that we're not talking enough about. And in general, it's just ineffective. It's not living up to the Lyon principle, right? Uh, that, that the patients with the least amount of symptoms should be treated at the lowest level, right? Um, and there's this problem, like once we, like there's this vicious cycle in this as well. So once we've created access block, for primary care physicians um, and so on, then they like then the patient has to go somewhere else, and that's usually the emergency department to to get the care that they used to go to their like the primary care physician uh, to. But because there is a wait time for uh, of two or three weeks uh, there, then they cannot get it. And once they get to the emergency department, because of our flow problems, then they usually get the blood samples and they usually get the CT scans on a very low threshold because we need to get on on with the next patient and so on and so forth. Right? So it's a really vicious cycle that we can only break, I think, um, by, um, like, as an individual, by talking about, um, like, communi communicating with our patients and, and kind of doing the compassionate care thing, um, using shared decision making and so on. But at a system level, this is probably where we need, really need to take uh, a step and need to inform our, the leaders about this problem. And then as a doctor, um, I talk about a lot, of, I, I often talk about this numbers needed to treat equals one, that the purpose as a doctor is numbers needed to treat equals one, that every time we see a patient, uh, the patient should be better off as a product of our interaction. doesn't mean that they should be like cured or anything. They just need to be um, better off either mentally or we need to, we have laid a plan or we have planted a seed uh, for their next step, uh, or we, yeah, we, they, they, and, or, or we listen to them, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Um, which is therapeutic in, in and of itself, if we do it with compassion. Um, and if we don't, if we, if we overdiagnose people, then, then we, we don't live up to this principle oftentimes because then we're creating harm. Um, and so, um, if we're not sharing the decision making with them, then usually that's a, like that's where it creates this kind of harm. Um, then also like within medicine, if we if we if we like if we do the scan and then we find something that we think is a, like is correlated with our symptoms, then we may be satisfying, right? We may be um, finding what oh well they do have succimental PE but we kind of miss that they also have pneumothorax or we kind of miss that they have an ACS really and we forgot to take the ECG or something like that right we're we're we're, we're focusing on what is there but kind of not thinking about not always thinking about what what is actually happening and another like thing is like if you diagnose a subsegmental sub segmental PE now, then the rest of the life of that patient, <clears throat> that would be a, this is going to be a problem, right? Because that's a risk factor. Um, even though it's a minor, minor disease, um, then it's classified as a risk factor now. And that's a problem um, like downstream for that patient for the rest of their life. They will get a CC scan much more readily once they arrive at a, at a, um, at a uh, hospital than they used to. And sometimes if you do diagnose these 
patients with like submental P or, or they were, and they come in with chest pain. What was actually the underlying problem may be missed. That's like satisfying, but it may also be a psychosomatic problem, right? It might, it might also be like anxiety or fear or whatever that we should have addressed. And now we have put them into this diagnostic labeling and, and every time they get the chest pain, then they say, oh, this might PE again. And, and, and then they go to the CT scan again. And they, um, it's a vicious cycle. We can, we can create these vicious cycles for patients uh, if we don't communicate well with them about the risks of this overdiagnosis. All right, <clears throat> moving Moving on to the drivers of overdiagnosis. Um, and let's just take an overview of the, the drivers. So um, there's different like overviews here. I'll move over this from Thomas Bjorn Hoffman and go to this one. So um, there's, and you can read this by yourself, like what drives um, emergency, like what drives this? There are cultural drivers, health system drivers, industry technology drivers, professional drivers, and patient and public drivers, right? Lots of things to talk about, and here's also the solutions. <clears throat> I'll encourage you to check out these articles. I'll just pick out a few that I think are really important. Um, also from Eddie Lang's paper here. This is more manageable, and they go through all of the drivers in EM Cases Quick Hits episode 39. So you can check out that if you if you don't want to read it. But I'll just pick out a few of these drivers. So, all right. So more sensitive tests we, we've already talked about. Um, like, our tests are becoming more and more sensitive. The problem then is we're seeing things that we um, we cannot um, unsee, sort of. Like, we're going into what is probably normal variation from from going from pathology to something that is normal variation and this is especially um, important when we're talking about asymptomatic patients and in you may think like or what is what does this mean in emergency medicine we don't test asymptomatic patients but we do our tests um, like when we test for the hepatitis then suddenly now if we're with a very really sensitive test then we can find that in like kidney incidentaloma, uh, right? That's kind of a screening as well. And I believe like a lot of patients, like I don't know the studies on this, but patients going through a, a emergency, an emergency department, a lot of them will get some kind of scan, right? Uh, that, and, it, and a lot of it is not relevant. We, we use these packages like uh, blood sample packages um, as well like oh, you, you in Sweden it's called the boss profile like the, get the like the standard tests um, and doing standard tests in this more and more diluted population that comes to the emergency department because of access block um, other places in the system will make a huge problem when these tests are really sensitive so that's like over detection is we're detecting more and more. Um, it's real disease in, under the microscope, but probably we shouldn't de def define disease as under the microscope anymore. <clears throat> Another way of looking at this is I really, really encourage you to look the, uh, up Adam Rothman's podcast and especially this video here where he goes through the history of diagnostics. Uh, this is the signal theory, like the signal noise theory. Um, if we increase the sensitivity of anything, we, we might think of it as a radar. Uh, we, on a radar screen, we want to find the dots. If we increase the sensitivity, then we'll find a lot of dots, all of the dots, but a lot of it is murky. And that's a problem with sensitivity, increasing the sensitivity. Um, so over detection, according to Bolson, is it refers to the identification of abnormalities that were never going to cause harm, abnormalities that do not progress, that progress too slowly or to uh, to cause symptoms, to cause symptoms or harm during the person's remaining lifetime, and that results or that results results spontaneously. Increasing use of high-resolution diagnostic technologies increase the risk of such overdetection. For example, high-resolution CT scans for subsequent um, pulmonary embolism. As we said, the jury is still out on this one. There may be depending on the risk factors and so on, but we'll see. Well, as an example, is quite a good example. Um, it's what we call um, like moving the needle to the left, or like what we call creep. Like we're 
finding more and more about the of these and and not these when we do these uh, sensitive tests. We're finding the turtles, not the rabbits that we want to find over here. <clears throat> and then we have the birds um, somewhere around here. Right? Thomas Hoffman has has, uh, has written about this in his really good article, Too Much Technology. Like, it, when technology improves and we increase our accuracy, sensitive and specificity, more cases are detected, more frequently, and then we, 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 we will test more because we can find more, uh, because there's an, in, there is an expectation to find th stuff when we can. Um, this is shift the, C the C spectrum towards the uh, milder forms, as we saw on, on this graph we just showed. And now, now the definition of that disease is different. Like a PE 40 years ago, like when you looked at the illness script 40 years ago in the books, it was totally different than it was today, than it is today, right? Because now, because of the dilution of the, di like what we find as PEs, like the symptoms spectrum has become so wide that we can, we might as well just test, just like test everyone with a test for PE because we will find them because it will be either uh, misdiagnosis, right, false positives, um, but more commonly it will be overdiagnosed because a lot of us probably go walk around with these small pulmonary embolisms, uh, especially after we've been flying or whatever, and it doesn't matter, right? Unless, in parentheses, maybe unless we have risk factors outside of the just uh, like temporal risk risk factors, right? Um, because that, but that, um, this may, may or may not uh, get to improve the treatment outcomes. Um, then we'll get more survivors and more survivor stories. We'll talk about the survivor paradox or the screening paradox. And we'll just, this will just keep going. All right. The problems for this is like, the, it, there's an increased cost involved unrealistic expectations uh, on born and then will be hype everyone wants to test and we widened the disease categories because we're testing more and more we're finding more and more uh, finding more and more we're medicalization we're medicalizing a normal life um, and this will um, like there will be increased uh, errors for 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 um, um, because we're overdiagnosing people, right? Uh, and then we may be overtreating them and overdiagnosing them here. And um, uh, sorry, I forget the details of all of these. But in general, like there, there's this vicious cycle that create is created usually by this. And you can check out this too much technology. All right. <clears throat> Then the other thing about what drives this is overdefinition, and we talked about like lowering the threshold for what we call disease. According to Bolas, and again, overdefinition, creep or dilution or um, diagno diagnosis culture, medicalization or temp yeah, what you might call it, occurs by two mechanisms: lowering the threshold for a risk factor without evidence that doing so helps people uh, feel better or live longer. And by expanding disease definitions to include patients with ambiguous or very mild symptoms, an example of lowering a threshold would be that, like as we said, lowering the systolic breath, uh, blood pressure. And we talked about this graph, um, which is from this um, this uh, source here, uh, Tereiro, um, where you can see like a small small shift in the diagnostic criteria will often mean that like because it's the mild, milder end of the patient population is always is usually the majority of the population or a, a big like much bigger than the severe diseases right and we better know that it helps when we make so big a part such big a part of the people the patients both because of their own health but also because of their system problems with it then we have culture, and that's I think it's really important to talk about the culture <clears throat> and the problem with uh, culture in this um, in this uh, aspect. And Jerome Hoffman talks a lot about this, and I love his lectures on this. Um, so, in general, the cultural problems professionally, like in our field, and also publicly, the culture of the myths that we believe. So we believe that faith in early detection is much better than like finding something early is always better. Having more information about a problem is always better. 
than not having it. And that's a myth. There may be ex there are exceptions, but in general, it's not good uh, to have a CT scan on the first or second day that you have a symptom. For emergency department usage, I um, I often talk about um, so like when we have tested recently for a condition for the, and we've what we think have ruled out the most um, the dangerous stuff. Um, then the patient is often left with, well, why do I then have these symptoms? And I often tell the patients then that, like, also also when they come in through the door, that the, the expectations, expectation today in the emergency department is to, like, rule out dangerous disease. We're not necessarily going to find out what the cause is. And I usually talk about this with patients that... Um, I think from the onset has a low probability to have any serious conditions so that they know they, they will go home with their symptoms and that's all right, as long as they're manageable, of course. Um, and I often talk, to, talk with them about, well, the last, like, the la like when we've done, the, done the, all the tests and the workup and, and the clinical um, evaluation, and then we're often um, left with a post-test probability of, um, like a low post-test probability of anything dangerous. And I usually say like, the, <laughs> but what, what is it then? Well, the last couple of, like what it is, is often expensive to find out, especially early on. Um, we should use time as a test. Uh, that's what we do in emergency medicine. We rule out stuff and then we let time be the test. And if it's persistent symptoms, then we should talk with the primary care physician, or you can always come back. But in general, it's better to leave it at, uh, as it is, if, if it's something that has only lasted for a couple of days and we don't find anything dangerous, right? Knowing what it is is expensive, um, because it may lead to overdiagnosis. Um, the other thing is wanting to know now, like, um, so people don't have the time and we don't have the time. That's not people's fault. It's usually, uh, or it's at least the majority of cases is usually the system's fault that we don't have time to take care of, like, like take time off our jobs to go to the doctor. Um, uh, society is demanding stuff from us so that we need to know now. Uh, whether this, what is this and how can I treat it, right? We don't want to go to the doctor in, in another week and another week after that. But the problem is that, like, diagnosis, if it's not dangerous, is a lot, a lot like baking a cake, or like it takes the time that it takes. And when you seek the doctor, then you usually are at your highest, uh, like, symptom, like, you, there's the most symptoms of this, like, disease period. And usually it'll go down from there. Or you will regress to the mean, right? That's the concept of regression to the mean. And if we just use time as a test, then it's no problem. But with this, like, we want to hurry and like know what it is and know that it's not dangerous and so on. Then we are pushing. Uh, we're pushing the boundaries, and we are um, we're not getting the like we're not allowing our doctors to have this time as a test that is so valuable as also John Paulson has talked about a lot um, because most things are self-limiting from a system point of view well you can imagine if we do CT scans on day one on every patient then there will be lots and lots of over diagnosis there might be one in a thousand one in a hundred that will pick up early but it might not have meant anything because that, that would be have picked up anyway if we just made the symptoms go on for a little longer. So in a system <clears throat> where we don't want to miss anything, we want to know now, and we have increasingly sensitive tests, and, and we also have like fear of missing anything. Um, you can see like we're painting a picture where we, 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 we were over, over detecting, over defin defining, over diagnosing so, 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 so much, probably. If we're not thinking about it and we're not informing our patients about it. So what we are, what we're leading to, like the patient to is this, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to 
uh, what I do as an emergency physician in westernized capital here in Stockholm is oftentimes that I I try to save the patient from the westernized medical machine or at least inform them what they're getting their self, themselves into if they keep going down this path. With, if I find that they have low post-test probability uh, for disease. And then there's the thing about the test, like uh, the test, uh, like uh, as Jerome Hoffman often talks about, well, we think about the test as being something magical and objective, right? There could not be anything wrong with the test, even though our clinical examination is perfectly fine and there's never been any studies on, like there's very, very few studies on the different, like gestalt or clinical uh, evaluation of an expert uh, physician. Um, as opposed to the test, the tests are great, but they're a tool. They're not like they're not the be on be all end all. We determine the pretest probability, and the test is the likelihood ratio that we adjust our um, pretest probability with to get the postest probability. But we don't start with the test. That's that's backwards. That's a problem, and that's just screening patients, right? But as we talked about the elephant in the brain part, like it's what's sadly expected now so we need to like how do we ch like how do we turn this uh, big ship around it will take a long time and but it will take and it will take role modeling um but and but it starts with like knowing these problems i think okay and we this is just a graphically um a graph that i simplified about like if you get the disease uh, or you get sorry you get your symptoms then uh, you get to, get to day one in the early stages of this uh, disease or illness and then usually there's a spontaneous remission then you won't go to the doctor or it's unchanged or it may, may decrease like be become worse and then at some points the, the you'll go to the doctor and then like if we if we if we and then there's be another situation where it can go either better, worse, or unchanged, and so on. And in all these states, like most of the time, things will be self-limiting. Most symptoms are self-limiting. There's this guy called Kurt, uh, Kurt Krinke, uh, K-U-R-T, K-R-O-E-N-K-E, uh, -E, who's made, like, uh, he's a primary care physician in, I think, Texas. Um, and he's done a lot of studies on like this symptoms that patients present with and and how we as physicians can kind of interpret their symptoms and whether or not they how how important they are um, uh, as opposed to like or, or, or how to how, how, how we should evaluate the symptoms that they with, with the precess probability that they uh, come with the, one of the problems that we haven't talked about uh, is the popularity par paradox, right? So if we overdiagnose people, screen more, then we will find more. And the ones because we don't know which diseases are overdiagnoses or and which like which part of the spectrum they are are they in the severe part or they're in, they're in the mild part, we don't know once we see it in front of us because everything in the microscope looks like the real deal. We don't know who's overdiagnosed, right? And the, the individual is really hard to know whether they were or not. And so the individual having breast cancer um, screening positive and finding breast cancer or, or PSA test testing positive and finding prostate cancer will say, well, I was the one in thousand or one in a hundred that benefited, right? Even if they were told that, oh, if like only one in a thousand will benefit well you the, i was the one who benefited they would say they are the survivors right and <laughs> once they have been the survivor then they then they will encourage others to do the test because because it it's it made them survive right so why wouldn't you share that this that's honorable to share something that that made you survive right so <clears throat> And this is this vicious cycle of overdiagnosis that that um, often can like avalanche and make it a much much bigger problem as well. That it drives overdiagnosis. I can so <laughs> more survivor stories leads to more useful screening uh, 
like it appears to be more like more um, useful and more intensive screening occurs and then we, more, we get more diagnosis like this positive cycle just keeps continuing right <clears throat> so that's <coughs> like these like these programs for treating cancer and so on is uh, it's honorable the idea of it but I think a lot of it is highly biased towards this kind of this, this screening in the population, which is really, really popularized and very popular by politicians to keep screening around. But it's probably not effective, but it's just creating these like survivor stories <clears throat> that, that feeds into itself and just makes more and more screening. All right, a last um, thing about the culture as a driver. Um, is this um, concept of uncertainty <clears throat> that is becoming more and more popular? And I think is really like it could be a podcast and video in and of itself. It may be one day. If you want to know more about this, you can start checking out Arbella Simpkins, Handling Uncertainty in the New Medical Revolution, and this excellent book by Catherine Montgomery uh, called How Do like it has a kind of bland title, but it's really, really deep and uh, fascinating for Dr. Street. It's called How Doctors Think. Um, and what Catherine Montgomery is, is essentially <clears throat> saying here is that she, uh, when, once we have our, we, we have these, this bank of illness scripts, and when, we, when we're talking about patients, we're kind of, um, getting information and data points and then we're getting like this kind of picture and then we kind of uh, like the patient presentation the picture that we have we kind of align that with our, with our illness scripts and the thing is these will never totally align it's kind of like they, we say like oh there's no like the patient never looked like like looks like uh, what they say in the books and that's true because the individual and the way that they describe it and how you interview them and so on and so forth will make this bubble, the black bubble here. And our illness scripts will always be a bit um, skewed or <clears throat> not totally aligning with like, oh, usually this syndrome has uh, has low blood pressure, but this patient didn't present with low blood pressure. They had high blood pressure. So it, it, it may not always align. There's definitely overlap. And the more overlap there is, this is what we would say, this is the disease, right? This is what it is that the patient is likely uh, presenting with. But they will never align totally, right? There will always be bits of the, bits and parts of the history, data points that we don't know why they are there. And this creates, like, so there's this, irreducible uncertainty with every encounter with a patient and if there's a high enough amount of um, data points that are not aligning then we may think oh this is something else but like just as a model there will always be uncertainty and how we handle this we, we cannot we cannot reduce this uncertainty by testing oftentimes this is a, a, often an irreducible or uncertainty and we just need to kind of be aware that, oh, there's uncertainty, there's discrepancy, and we cannot reduce this by doing tests. Um, <clears throat> and we just need to handle it and describe it with our patients, usually. All right, another thing, another driver that could be in and of itself a podcast on his own. I will just link these things or show you these <clears throat> sources down here. Ben Goldrigger, Jerome Hoffman, I John, uh, John Ioannidis, um, Ioannidis, uh, Justin Morgenstern, and so on. The conflict of interest problem. Um, so, and there's, I'll just highlight a few. So there's the problem of publish or perish culture that like, for instance, to get into academia, you need to publish stuff. Um, and the, the stuff that is published is is very, there's a, this huge publication bias, um, meaning that all the negative studies are not being published. Um, on top of that, even like if you go, in, go into the electron microscope of, of each study, then John Ioannidis has, has shown that in the like in the study we may be doing um, significant chasing biases call it like p where, where it may be p hacking that we're doing that on the, of the data set we'll just choose the choose the uh, outcomes that is fitting with our 
fitting with what we want maybe like, often subconsciously not consciously but usually subconsciously instead of like actually doing unbiased science right so when we have a data set we we want to make the p-value just above like for significance right and we may choose our decisions unconsciously to to get this at this goal so there's a huge risk of biases in our studies and that's why we're seeing this huge publication bias problem right <clears throat> so this kind of gets trickled down into um guidelines right because well um we if, if uh, there's this huge publication bias and reprodu and and as a result this we have like this re reproducibility crisis we cannot reproduce our studies right and uh, because they're, they're they're biased and skewed and and not well done and and not decently powered like 90 i think i only this you need this talks about like 99 percent of our studies are are garbage sadly or 95 percent something like that um <clears throat> but if we are only publishing the positive studies right then, then we have this huge problem with oh um and this gets into guidelines and then like we we, we don't we, this creates a problem with overdiagnosis because it's not outweighed with the with the negatives or the negative studies right and it gets at this like parachute argument again like we think that every study needs to be this god's gift to humankind like and most of the studies like statistically are really really um, always like negative because it's hard to do studies right all right but the problem is like because this is so like problematic to to get like th this entire culture of publish or perish we need to publish we need to do publish positive studies that's both the universities but also the medical um medical industrial complex um and, and they're not evil it's just the game that we have made for them that's the like and without regulation because of probably because of and i'm not politically blaming like that but usually people point the finger to neoliberalism in the 80s for like deregulation of everything that's one of the problems with this or one of the core reasons for this it means that like as ben goldegger will would would argue we need like pharmaceutical companies need to kind of use guidelines as their as their advertisement um because it's just uh so problematic to like it's really hard to inform the entire medical community because we're kind of bad at informing each other on the newest stuff there's so much noise so like the, the like the pervasive uh, incentives from from companies uh, is at a guideline level and it's at, it has a research level as well then you have the uh, but also like universities are part of this as well um, then you have the disease mongering which is more like the industrial complex thing where well you have a drug that is not used for anything but you can always create a theory around it that argue, some argue that the sertraline theory or ser serotonin theory of ssris is part of this is an exact is an example of this i know peter gutsche would uh, probably say that at least and so this disease mongering and inventing diseases that are not there or or get, get inventing drugs for normal behavior that suddenly then becomes uh, like medicalized uh, like and now we have to diagnose it that's part of, part of this like drive but there might also be professional like non-money related um conflicts of interest right maybe that some professors uh, have been working on a problem for a long time and they've like their entire life they've studied subsegmental PEs and the benefit or whatever for for that and then when they get on the guideline commission then they are then they like unproportionately um, hail their kind of theory or research so that it gets uh, much more in the guideline that it should on average and so there's there's also professional conflicts of interest driving these problems right 
So if we if we there's, it was just four of the drivers, there's lots of other drivers, right? But these are some of the more important ones, I think. So if we take all the drivers, like so, um, so in general, like if we have this ideal, uh, like what we want according to Jerome Hoffman is what we call the fiduciary or fiduciary duty. We want to put the patients, the patients' bets at the uh, like as the first priority always, right? We were um, that that's our duty, um, and that's like also ethically what we are here to. Society has paid us to do that. Uh, they paid for edu education, and ethically, that's what we should do. Um, and then all the other priorities, our own best, and everything else comes comes second, right? Um, but the problem is that when we have this, all these drivers, like earlier is better, believe in tests um, more than the clinical uh, expectation or the clinical evaluation, we think more is more, and like we and we want to know what's wrong, and not just say like, well, it's not dangerous. We can just go home and use the time as a test. We have this huge fear of if we are missing anything, or if if the, if the patient that I talked out of getting a CT scan goes to another hospital in a week and gets the CT scan and have a submental subsegmental PE, then they'll say, oh, it was missed at the first. But I, if if I haven't informed them, probably uh, probably on the problems with diagnosing at low pretest probability right or doing tests uh, on low pretest probability then they'll, then they'll say oh I, I made a fault which is not the case um, but I think the problem is there we don't inform the patient of these things um, and we have this culture of blame in general that <clears throat> we are expected to be unfallible and that like that drives our need for high sensitive tests up and up and up and doing tests and we don't think we have the time anymore so we'll just do tests um, instead of like that's my dad uh, who's also a uh, private who, who's a private practice physician usually says like it takes um, it takes five minutes to um, prescribe drugs it takes 10 minutes to explain to the patient why they should not have the drug like antibiotics and well yeah so the thing is if you have a private private practice where you have a, an at fifth at finite amount of patients then you have a um then you have a driver to actually kind of inform the patient for 10 minutes because that will trickle down uh, and, and make a culture in your community here that well you shouldn't and that's i think that's kind of the, one of the solutions to this as well but the fear of fallibility like um, check out Justin, like, or sorry, Jerome Hoffman's BMJ podcast on that that I linked to in the beginning. And then the thing that yeah, we cannot use the time as a test, um, and the problem is that we have these readily available, highly sensitive tests that will over detect and so on and so forth. Expanding diagnostic, diagnostic definitions, and we are driven by companies to and guidelines that are owned by companies usually, or bought by by bought by companies. Um, all of this drives us to kind of shift our attention from the patient's best. We will we will we will trade uh, the um, we will trade the, our risk, uh, or the the problem is we are the ones who are at risk of get, of getting um, problems. We 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 like if we don't care, we can just use the test on the every patient, right? Um, and and. Uh, the, the reason why we should have these conversations is because we do care and that's we and we should remind the patients of that when we like that's what jerome hoffman usually said says like we should remind the patients that the reason why we're even talking about these like risks and benefits is because it's much easier to, for me to just do the tests and just give you the risk of being overdiagnosed. that's like no one is testing me on that but I, I'm doing this conversation with you because I care and I want the best for you. Um, yeah, but if but if we if we don't if we just if we stop caring or if we're too afraid to actually care or we don't have we don't feel that we have the time or so on, then we will, we are we are changing. We 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 don't want to bear the risk, and that means that we're putting a patient in in the second position uh, in the priority, and that's not our duty. That's detrimental to our purpose. Okay, so potential solutions to this massive and complex problem. Uh, so 
this article by Patriana uh, talks about a lot of solutions. You can check that out. Um, but in general, I'll, I'll be focusing on not the system level solutions. Um, I'll try to say like, what are you going to do as an emergency physician on your ne next shifts? Well, you have to know about precise probability or Bayesian thinking and the threshold model to kind of know like gauge where is the patient in this threshold model. Uh, if they're be like below the diagnostic threshold, then it's kind of then 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 that's where you want to kind of have this shared decision making conversation with the patient, especially and. Um, yeah, we, we want to focus on communication and compassionate care, but also this shared decision making concept. Um, where, like, the essence of shared decision making is that you're, you as a doctor, is the expert on decision making. Uh, sorry, you're the expert on in medicine, and the patient is the expert on their condition. And so, this interaction between doctor and patient is the interaction between two experts. And we are we are kind of consulting them on their expertise and 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 so we should we should we should share the share their uh, our thoughts and the risks and benefits and so on and there's different ways of doing that um and so there's like three shared decision making can be I guess I see it as a spectrum you have. At one end, the very paternalistic, person, and the on the other, um, uh, on the other end, you have like the non-paternalistic, but very, um, very informative, but maybe not, not as um, uh, uh, responsibility-taking um, part. So it's kind of um, so. So I guess there's several models for decision making, but one is it's just we inform patients about all the all the like possible um all the possible outcomes and and like you can have this or you can have this and you can have this but you we, we don't take any stance on what they should choose we just say oh that's up to you i don't think that's that version of shared decision making like i, I rarely use that one there might be situations where it may be a good one but in general I often try to do another kind of shared decision making where, where I kind of inform them about their possible outcomes and and uh, like uh, we'll get to the three questions that is important to answer for each pro for each patient. But uh, once we have uh, gotten to this point um, and informed them, then we should end off with um, saying like what our opinion is expert uh, to expert um what would we would what would we do in this situation or what would we recommend the patient to do knowing what we know about them now <clears throat> yeah so we'll go into that but then we have to inform of the risk of our diagnosis we like this is something that we just as we inform of other risks, like when you have a patient with low precise probability, or when we're doing a really, really sensitive scan or test, we should um, we should inform about the risk of doing this, and we should use the time as a test. When the low, when there's a low post-test probability of uh, severe disease or dangerous disease, then we should use the regression to the mean and the, this, like, to get the patient to 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 get like filtered out all the self-limiting people and the problem is people are only self-limiting if we communicate right with them if we induce fear in them or um, if we um, if we kind of give them a diagnosis that is not useful for them then they then they then then they then, the, then we may buy um then we may induce iatrogenic harm on them just by communicating badly with them or um, inducing this like diagnostic label on them. So time as a test, if you, if you can delay the diagnostic uh, evaluation in mild disease, then we, then we most definitely should, I believe. And once we find it, we can often not not treat it, so so we, we should not get to the point where we have to treat it. We should before getting these tests, we should have this conversation with the patient. So that's what we, I'm going to focus on here. So this is from um, Probst. Um, 
I have the reference in the beginning, profs it all. Um, so in the emergency department, how do we like, uh, should we, should we do shared decision making? Well, is there more than one reasonable option? If, if no, then we should probably just try to persuade the patient. If we believe, um, believe that the treatment is best, like 50 year old with a STEMI, <laughs> uh, we should like, there's not much to choose from there. There's thrombolysis and there's um, PCI, right? And PCI is the better one uh, in almost all westernized society within two hours drive, right? Um, so PCI would be the better one there if we really think this is a STEMI. Um, there's not much to choose from. So in, in, in those cases, probably compassionate paternalism, uh, per, per, uh, paternalism would be maybe be the better way. Um, yeah, at least knowing, like informing them about the prop, like the way, like the, you are the right spectrum, like the right side of this graph that I usually like the benefit harm graph. You should take this, um, option. And then there is the patient willing to, like, do you want to engage in this? And if they don't want to get engaged, then we will make the decision for them. If they're not in the position of, like, if, if it's a thrombolysis patient, sometimes they are either aphasic or they are not. Um, then they're not uh, in a condition where they can talk. Um, or they're too stressed out. Then, then well, either we talk about, talk with our um, loved ones, or we 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 make the decision um, as if they were sitting and having the conversation with us, knowing in the back of our minds that we are over, uh, um, we are um, often overestimating the benefits and underestimating the harms, right? And then there is, is there enough time? And that's depends on the discussion and time. And we, like time as a concept is often, and the, 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 the feeling of there is no time is often problematic for communication. Often there is time, but we just feel like there is no time. It doesn't necessarily take too much time to do it. But yeah, these are like, I think these are good screening questions for when to engage in shared decision making. That's why I, I put them in. Then I have this graph and like, this, <laughs> there's a lot to, unpack here but in general if you have a likelihood ratio of or likelihood of 100 here and zero percent like this is a bayesian spectrum of diagnosis then if the diagnosis in question is below this spectrum then then we would probably not say, well, we'll just say well you're 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 all right you don't have to talk about anything more you, you you're free to go home that's more like a personalistic one um, sometimes we do need, need to engage in the shared decision making here because they are too afraid to go home or we may, may need to like again communication skills and so on that's another lecture but that what that's, that's something, something we could do we just talked about <clears throat> if you have the STEMI then we probably want to choose a more personal personalistic um, road um, because or we will press highly on the benefits of the treatment because we know that there's benefit um, and we have a lot of treatments where there is real benefit and we should press on but mostly when we're in like this middle land of diagnostics then we can engage in shared decision making and and then then there's these <clears throat> three questions by alexander barrett reference down here and she's also on the, on the um, recommended dose podcast, um, where we should like there's these three questions that all patients should ask their doctor, and we should know. And it's hard to know these <laughs> answers because it's hard because the guidelines are not informing us because it's hard to dig up these answers. But we'll try. So the first question is usually like, what are my like, what is my diagnosis? How how sure are we of this this diagnosis and um, what are my opportunities, kind of? And um, the second question is usually like, okay, so from that diagnosis, what are the, or then my, what's the, what happens if I treat it? What happens if I don't treat it? And especially like, like what happens if I don't treat it is really important, like, because we think, oh, you will die if you don't treat it. But most times it's just like, well, there's a risk involved in not treating it, but you may survive. 
All right. And what is how much evidence do we have for these things? Like, how much do we think, or how sure are we? And so, so these are the like these are the like in the sense in essence the two questions to begin with, and then the last one you and like you end up with is like, what do you as an expert think in my condition that I should do? As a co like here we like kind of consulting, all right, um, and then. The problem is here, like, what do we think the patients should do? It kind of depends oftentimes on what kind of risk aversiveness they have. Uh, this is, the last part here is from, um, is from Welch, um, I, uh, Gilder Welch, overdiagnosed book. Uh, in the end, he talks about this, that in the end, it's kind of up to the patient, right? Um, some patients may be in the pursuit of health where they don't want to be a patient. They don't want to be medicalized. Um, and then we should inform them that, well, this carries a minor risk of missing something at some point, because you may be that you may miss that one in a hundred, one in a thousand, something like that chance of, of getting this diagnosis, but you will have a much lower risk <clears throat> of becoming a patient unnecessarily. <laughs> and being overdiagnosed, but the other way, the, but the other um, way is the pursuit of disease, All right? Where you are going to get the other passport, because here you 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 want to be certain that what is the cause, and oftentimes it's hard. But you okay, you will get, you want this, you you really you want this CC scan. That's all right, because you may be so afraid um, that you you cannot think without doing that. Um, but there's just like, this much more a psychological question oftentimes because the fear will not go away <laughs> uh, just by doing the scan it will just reoccur uh, once that scan is done there will be another one choosing this pathway which is not like it's common to have either uh, thoughts right or a spe this is, with this is a spectrum some are more towards this and some are more towards this you would they will like have a this maybe one in a hundred chance of finding something that the other ones would not be finding and maybe that would be true disease that is treatable and, and should be treated but oftentimes it overdiagnosis right um and they will have a much higher risk of being medicalized having low value care and having this like this cascade of care becoming a patient being over medicalized so on and so forth right so the pursuit of disease pathway or the pursuit of health pathway is kind of like what we have to sense as well when we're talking with a patient and giving them our advice for it because I think a lot of doctors would be over here, some would be over here, but it depends. Yeah, and this is just a threshold model here just to, to remind you that this exists and these are the thresholds that we're talking about. Another more novel way of doing sure decision making, especially when it comes to prognosticating and making decisions with the patient, is this best case, worst case scenario, kind of where we and where uh, which is from the life in the fast lane. You can check out best case, worst case scenario, life in the fast lane, and then you can see this video. Um, and I really kind of love this um, approach to sure decision making because it's 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 very illustrative for the patients or their families like you draw a spectrum of like what is the uh, most like like you go you you're going to have a ct scan uh, for pulmonary embolism that's the, that or that that is the question that we want to answer should we do this or not well in the in the worst case scenario you have a big pe that i'm missing from all of the tests that we've done from all of everything that we've done and seeing as i think you have a low priestess probability of this i would say that the chance of this is maybe one or two percent that's a really really low risk there's no not a no risk but it's a really really low risk and then you have the best case, uh, like, in, in, but in like in the best case scenario, then you have um, you don't have anything, um, and, and 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 we will not um, miss anything by not doing anything, um, and you'll go home and live a happy life, and the symptoms will go over after a while. I think the 
your your, <clears throat> your chance of this maybe I don't know, 85 or 80 percent of that. And then there's this middle ground where there's a risk of you being overdiagnosed, and that's uh, that's also like a bad outcome, and that that that, um, that might be 10 percent risk or something like that. And then you draw the spectrum, and you kind of show where on the line are you. And I think uh, you're very much toward because of your like condition, you're very much towards the um, mild end of the spectrum. And I, I would strongly encourage you to get this. It's not quite. I would strongly encourage you to not get this CT scan. It's kind of if you look at the stimulus podcast uh, and Justin Morgenstern's blocks on these topics, they will, they can detail on how to like communicate in a better way um, to get the patient to this point. Um, but I'll, I'll encourage you just to check out this video because I'm not explaining it in a, in a, in the best way possible. I'll yeah, check this video out. I think it is really nice. We may, Gerd Gigeran says a cognitive psychologist who talks about this risk literacy and he, he has this Hardinger Institute um, where he talks about like if you just can show the patient the risks then they will know be able to to, to, to understand and then they will they will be able to um, to drive out an answer by themselves um, so you can check out their infographics on the Hardinger Center homepage to to and there a lot of other homepages are making these infographics as well that are well done. Um, um, so that's also a way of getting for specific cases um, risk um, risk uh, literacy in there. Um, if you want to read more about it, I, I've I posted this article in the references as well uh, about um, from Freeman on how to communicate risk. You can read this up on yourself. But in general, we should use the patient's language and not uh, and everyday words, and not too much technical language, not too much information. Just get right to the point um, when it comes to the technical information, at least. Don't beat around the bush. No information overload. Don't rely on words. Like we have to write it down. Use graphics if you can. Be upfront and precise about our uncertainties. Like what if. This is not the diagnosis. What, what, how, how certain are we of that? What if I don't do anything, and, yeah, and so on. And then just to end with, I made this case. It's a totally made up example, but let's say that you have a patient who is has a thunderclap headache, um, and you propose a CC and then an LP um, because she presents at its, at the seventh hour or eighth hour, but she's a lawyer and she. Uh, requires or she, she demands that she'll get a CC with angio, uh, angio contrast um, because, because she has a fear uh, of, and she wants this done <clears throat> and you do your fiduciary duty and try to talk her out of it but she was she, she don't want to be mistreated as some of her friends and she's heard a survivor story that one of her friends did get this, this CT and they, they, that showed an aneurysm, and then she was operated on, and that was perfect because then the, she was survived. She survived, right? Or this survival paradox uh, might has been might have been playing in here. Um, she's also like unproportionately uh, anxious that if she if you if you if we do this scan, if we don't do this scan, then she'll just don't go home and die. She thinks that getting to know what is there is much better than not knowing. Um, so she, one of your colleagues, she, she well, orders this scan and finds a small aneurysm, um, but no bleeding. And then a new a new scan is done in a couple of days uh, to see that it's not a it's not a false positive, but it, it is a real aneurysm. Um, and because she, she cannot sleep anymore because she knows she has this aneurysm, she cannot go anywhere. It is socially problematic for her. Uh, but then she gets it removed, and 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 once she gets it removed, she tells all of her friends and Instagram account that she has um, survived this condition, um, and everyone should get this. And then you have this self-fulfilling prophecy cycle. Um, but and but then I. The alternative way is if is before getting the scan, you will inform about the 
risk of getting it and and the and the potential risks of overdiagnosis so just the take home <clears throat> for emergency physicians is overdiagnosis is a central concept and we are contributing to it if we do not know about this concept so we should know about this concept <clears throat> we should inform our peers and and bring this up when we're discussing diagnostics and cases low pre-test probability patients um, if they have a sensitive te test ahead we should inform them carefully about the uh, ensure decision making fashion um, <clears throat> um, that they're both at risk of, of false positives and overdiagnosis um, and knowing what is the reason is really expensive but ruling out stuff is usually not expensive for for them so we should use our tests cautiously and not in early stage of the disease know what it is just because we want to know and use time as a test if they're low, low risk send them home use progression to the mean all right, I'll end with a quote by Iona Heath. What we need is courage to always consider the timely, the concrete, the local, and the particular when we care for each individual patient. And if necessary, the courage to dis disregard the rules, the guidelines, and so on. Only on this basis can we build a resourceful and thoughtful healthcare community. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>